everyone for joining us. A beautiful Tuesday night in New York City. Um, okay. Okay. All right. Um, good evening, and welcome to the New York Studio School's virtual evening lecture series. Uh, tonight, we are. Um, it is our great pleasure to be joined by Shazia Sikander and to hear her present on her work. Um, tonight is also the first lecture of our fall 2021 season, and I can't think of a better way to start it. So thank you, Shazia, for joining us. Um, so, um, um, I would also, uh, so thanks everyone for joining us. Um, on this Tuesday evening. And I would just also like to recognize that the New York Studio School Evening Lecture Series is gener generously supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs um, in partnership with the City Council, the Robert Lehman Foundation, and, and the National Endowment for the Arts, um, as well as many individual contributors. And I'm sure many of you in the audience um, may have contributed at some point. So thank you very much. Um, if anyone would like to donate either during or after tonight's talk, uh, please just click on the support button on our homepage, uh, www.nyss.org. And please stay, to stay tuned for our entire season. This is the first of 15 lectures and it runs through December. Um, we're really excited about the programming this year. So um, thank you. Um, before I introduce Shazia, I just also want to point out, though I'm sure we're all very familiar at this point, but at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Um, just go ahead and, and put a question in at any point during the talk, um, and we'll get back to those at the end of the lecture. We'll have time for Q&A. Um, so don't worry if it's not addressed immediately. OK. Um, Shazia Sikander is currently the subject of a traveling exhibition entitled Shazia Sikander Extraordinary Realities. Um, the exhibition was just here at our own uh, Morgan Library Museum closed on Sunday and it is, will now travel to the RISD Museum opening on November 12th um, and then the MFA in Houston in March 2022. So I hope you're able to see it in person wherever you are in the country. Um, Shazia is a recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship in the State Department Medal of Arts, and her, and her work has been exhi exhibited and collected internationally. Um, so please join me in virtually welcoming Shazia Sikander. Hi, everyone. Good evening. It's fantastic to be here at the New York Studio School again. I am honored to be invited and I look forward to a wonderful evening and I hope there'll be plenty of Q&A sessions. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and jump right into the presentation. So um, this show, which was up at the Morgan Library Museum, um, was, uh, I think it came down just two days ago on Sunday. And um, it is a traveling exhibition and it is um, sort of a, a little bit of a survey retrospective of a very focused period between the fall of Berlin Wall and 9-11 and a, a moment in, in the world when so much was changing and shifting. So it focuses on, on those shifts in terms of the social shifts, the political shifts, and how you know I came uh, from Pakistan, I grew up there, and, and the time when I uh, move into New York, I move into the US, and it sort of unpacks that particular moment. So because the show is traveling, I'm gonna share a little bit about this period of work that I made, which was um, more than 20 years ago and also have an opportunity to share some of, some of the recent works. So 
this, this exhibition is also in dialogue with an accompanying book, which is um, a little bit more like a scholarly book than just a catalog edited by uh, the curator Jan Howard from the RISD Museum and Professor Sadia Abbas, who is at Rutgers. So this entire project expands the work from a pan South Asian feminist American global historical archival perspective telling the story from Pakistan to Providence to Houston to New York. So all the cities that I sort of lived and worked in in that particular decade and obviously the communities and artists and politics of that period that I was engaged with. So I, um, what I really appreciated about this opportunity and this exhibition was that it was able to um, show a lot of the early interdisciplinary approaches which were um, percolating in my practice and also the observations around this exhibition that are both intimate and broad. They are both political and personal, also a lot of sort of witty and ir ironic observations that are in the work. And um, yeah, you know, for me, um, this exhibition also is, is basically the very first time that it has offered an opportunity for the work to be read in incredibly illuminating um, manner where the overlaps, the nuances, the lexicon, the research behind each work uh, surfaces. So there's opportunity to dig into each a body of work and unpack it. And I think that type of privilege, I, I don't think I had when I was making the work. It was often hijacked in terms of my biography. So in that sense, it's a very sort of a rewarding exhibition to be to have, but it also highlights how tough it is in the art world, right? And it, like even this particular exhibition took, um, took me like, 20 years to have a solo exhibition in an institution in New York City. Well, that, that, that itself is a separate topic for discussion, but I have had a three decade long research driven artistic process that examines the relationship between traditional and the avant-garde. I have examined Central and South Asian pre-modern manuscripts paintings learning the craft as well as the discourse. So during the European colonial era in the Indian subcontinent, for example, many South Asian manuscripts were dismembered, scattered and sold for profit, stunting the canon of Central and South Asian pictorial traditions for good. So, you know, this is a very significant history of um, a vernacular that, that doesn't necessarily sit comfortably in the lap of Western um, painting canon. And, and the irony of that is that because of a long history of colonial legacy, so much of that material from Asia resides in storages in Western institutions. And it, it, in, in an institution like um, the Morgan Library also, it has collections from that region. So I, I was encouraged to pull out a certain, uh, a few of those that, that are in, the, in this exhibition space. So they were not conceptually linked to my exhibition, but they were there outside in the vitrine. And um, which just gives people an idea of, of uh, how difficult, you know, these, the silos in art history are in terms of how things are, who gets to write the story behind histories. And, um, and that for me is really a very important place in my practice as a, as a very research driven practice that as I'm making my art, I'm also interested in unpacking these problematic spaces. So even the term miniature itself is, is a complicated term. It's a singular term that cannot encompass a fast history of diverse pictorial languages across many eras and geographies. So though it is, it is a problematic term, it's part of a European colonial legacy from 
as early as the 1600s when European merchant and tradesmen and later European scholars coming into South Asia encountered the local paintings and saw an analogous relationship to the European mini miniatures. So the term continues to be used. However, there are many scholars and artists that are making concerted effort to educate and use instead terms like manuscript painting. So I, I wrote about that um, recently in, in an article in New York Times, and there's more detail there if any of you are interested. So broadly speaking, this genre, the, ma the manuscript painting and the miniature painting that, that I am engaged with refers to pre-modern syncretic painting traditions of South and Central Asia. So again, another point, very important point that I want to share is that when I, was researching and learning it, I did not have access to the originals. The originals were in the West or they were in private collections, often perhaps in India. I, growing up in Pakistan, had access to a few at the, uh, at the Lahore Museum. So primarily I acquired an understanding by looking at books such as this, which is Howard Hodgkin's private collection of Indian paintings. And so it was often, it was much later when I, 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 I was traveling or I had moved to the West or I, I had the opportunity that I was able to go and look at the actual material in different storages and different libraries and different institutions. And of course, there's plenty in the British Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Royal Lab, the, uh, the British Library. And, and just to keep in mind that you know that the that the that this history that the fate of the manuscript south asian central asian manuscript has the fate has been shaped by the european colonial history so um moving on i'm going to uh, move into some paintings that i made which are, which are in this exhibition curated by RISD, which is now going to, going to open then in November. Like the work in the, on the left, when I, when I was sort of studying the techniques and, and, the, and, and, and the genre itself with the master painter in Pakistan, Bashir Ahmed, I recall like, especially as a, as a very young student, this idea of like studying from classical and, understanding the forms and sort of, you know, appropriating or copying them just for the pr premise to learn something. So this particular painting is on the left, but I had not yet even seen a color reproduction, which is on the, on the right. So the original resides in, at the Met. So that to, to understand that, to, in, to learn something from a facsimile of the original, puts a very different spin on whose language this is, who gets to speak on behalf of a certain presumed culture. And these are, these are things that interest me deeply, like how history is shaped and who gets to define um, the perspective of history. And um, so some of the early paintings that, that, um, that were and are in, as part of this exhibit there is this series called the Mirath, but just quickly pointing out that the ones that you saw earlier often would depict like a singular um, figurative representation. So as I was sort of studying that, I, 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 this is early, so I was still a teenager at that time. So I'm kind of wanting to bring the feminine into the, into the very thematic and historical space that often the representation of the female was ambiguous. It was often as if the female was awaiting an event that had yet to occur. So almost a passive um, relationship to past. And, and here are earlier interventions of either bringing um, friends of mine into the works or citing historical um, architectural places that were, that were complex, they marked the separation or partition of India and Pakistan. And so also the repetition of the figure here suggests the passage of time, which was a traditional device in Mughal paintings. So I'm kind of adapting that and moving that forward. And 
you know, at that time, at that age, to create contemporary manuscripts in the 1980s in Pakistan was a radical step for me as a young artist, when the regional status of miniature painting was mired in tourist kitsch. So the first, this painting that the scroll uh, emerged as a tipping point, laying to rest the debate about miniatures inability to engage the youth. It, it launched what is now called the new miniature movement. So when I start, I was starting with the master painter Bashir Ahmed, and although the thesis requirements then were to produce detailed miniature paintings, the size of a notebook page, I instead sort of made this singular five foot miniature painting that takes me about a year and a half or two years to make. So it depicts various stages of youth, the young female protagonist that you see as you enter the painting reads left to right. So she sort of, she's stepping over a threshold symbolized as a frame, taking herself and others, which is the viewer, along into a new territory, a new beginning. So the woman in the scroll is, is kind of like the poltergeist, the ghost that is still perhaps trapped in all her internal conflicts, but she still remains a more of an active agency. And it was sort of that, that's the departure here, but also it, it was my first sort of attempt to show women as proactive, intelligent, witty protagonists connected to the past in more imaginative ways. But you never really see her face. And this sort of, you know, her elastic, transparent, move, moving, morphing form. Um, later, when I, when I see this work, it reminds me at that time that I, it was about the freedom, like claiming the freedom of the body as, um, as like a very defining emotion in this particular painting. So I, I, was, I was of course looking a lot at cinema. So even um, uh, films to see how to unpack the folding, like unfolding of time, how to depict narrative, but also earlier traditions like the Safavid paintings that, that you see on the right. So there's a, there were large scale paintings that I was making to really make this very detailed uh, manuscript work also. So there was always this ongoing relationship with scale and with different mediums and being a painter, you know, it didn't, it wasn't like the only way of working was through a, through the manuscript work. So it was all these additional things which were always happening that were feeding into uh, this engagement with the manuscript also. But so when I come to the US, you know, um, or, or the, the, the attention that I had gotten in Pakistan as um, uh, because of this sort of rupture with this uh, thesis work was unknown. So um, that, that too is a very, now when I look back is, is important in the trajectory because in the early years of being in the US, my work was often seen through the lens of a Pakistani, a female, a Muslim female, an Asian first. Such opaque and broad projection emphasized the work as that of the other, an outsider from another culture, robbing the work of any meaningful and critical read. To counter, I started deconstructing exclusionary ideas within race representation, rejecting the colonial and male gaze and reimagining archetypal characters to tell richer stories. So the, you start seeing these sort of um, a vocabulary of forms that starts to emerge. And some of these, you know, they look different from the, from the scroll that you saw, but for me, there's a lot of similarities. If you look at some of these creatures that are like these little feminine monsters, you see that there's not a face, it, there is no face, it's but it's self-rooted. It's like they're floating and self-rooted. They don't yet, they're choosing to self-root or self-reference themselves, but they are buoyant. And um, so as I was developing these things, I was also looking at representation of certain cultures like Indian art or Islamic art in these very opaque uh, constructs in these, um, you know, coffee table books where all different types of of different languages and disciplines would be categorized and just sort of scattered into these very opaque categories. And I thought of them as these shadowless 
representations like these little monsters that would crawl out of the page to be reimagined and to take up as they please their own representations. So these are ideas that you know were emerging and I was playing with materials. So another example would be like this uh, painting called Housed with its cage-like form, a door, a pink heart lurking inside. You know, I was tapping into my anxiety of being boxed into a stereotype on behalf of a culture or a religion. And even works like in separate working things, I was exploring sort of two conflicting surface tensions by painting a graffiti-esque red burst across the meticulously labored miniature. So here the stock characters, which are like the lovers on horseback, a trope within the Indian painting tradition gets obliterated, destabilized. So the motif of heterosexual love is being, is being altered or changed. And in a painting series like The Uprooted Order, I was altering the trope of Radha and Krishna, the ideal female male representations. So I remove Krishna from the equation to focus on the feminine Radha's power. She's seen holding onto a hybrid character on the painting on the right, which looks like a griffin, but it's actually a Punjabi term is there for it. It's called the chalava, which refers to um, a, a creature which is ghost-like because it can never be uh, captured or it's so fast that it's always fleeting. So I was kind of looking into um, all the different types of paradoxes of rootedness who is local versus who is a foreign, foreigner. And these polarizing dichotomies that have long existed in, in Western imagination, like East, West, Islamic, Western, Asian, white, oppressive, free. When you encounter such binaries, which are so prevalent, especially in the early nineties, it led to an outburst of these androgynous forms, fragmented bodies, headless torsos, self-rooted, floating female forms that are half figurative, half animal that kind of refuse to belong, to be fixed, to be stereotyped. And many of these female iconographies, you know, that could be from comical to dark started resisting categorizations. So while I may be speaking at that time to my inability to locate Brown South Asian representation in the feminist space of the 1990s, art world and art history books. I was, it was also happening in conversation with other artists. So my um, friendship with the late African-American painter, Donna Maria Bruton is, is, is another history that ne has never been shared or brought about in the read of my work. So in this exhibition, we were able to bring works where both of us had worked on the same piece. So you can see that e either the concerns that are about patriarchal structures or women of color in a white art world in the early nineties, they, those conversations had overlaps and those conversations all are leading to a certain type of iconography that starts to emerge. And as that starts to happen, my work also started breaching national boundaries. So I started locating common ground between Pakistani feminists, writers, poets like Fahmida Riaz, Ismat Chuktai, Kishwar Nahid, Parveen Shakir, with Angela Carter, Julia Kristeva, Helen Susu, Bell Hooks, Michelle Wallace. So to understand feminist forms and in turn, to explore language from specific points and places of women's narratives. So, but, you know, I was doing the labor myself. These were not um, things that were happening or unfolding in the art history books or even in conversations around me. So that, that, that too is a very, it's a very important thing to keep in mind, like how, how much progress we have made, but still how, how little, um, you know, um, representation for women has, has evolved and shifted in the art world too. So as I was opening these ideas of nar narratives of gender and sexuality simultaneously, I was playing with the devices of center and margin that were found within the traditional miniature paintings. 
So here's an example called Who's Bailed Anyways? And here, you know, you can see the before and the after, but the protagonist that appears on the right to perhaps be a veiled female, on close inspection, you can see it's a stock character of a male polo player. So the male is still inside, uh, it's just under. And I was thinking of the white line as almost like the whiteout, the editing tool. And all the color that I use for this type of painting is that it's first made with a foundation of white and then colors injected. So all, so I was thinking if I remove all the color and then I can, then I'm, I'm playing with the body because all the color has been removed. So I can then think of it as more like a, a different, different conceptual engagement with material too. So the, so, some of these early sort of paintings that each individual painting has like, you know, a problem to be solved or a problem to be articulated and then addressed within itself. Whether, whether it's also kind of, narratives and stories that you know that that may be known between like a very secular judo christian uh, uh world of storytelling but some of that is already familiar to me or or across asia because again um it's through it's through these vast plural histories historical histories that have always been about the interface about the exchange so so here too, I, I, I was referencing the biblical story of the serpent as sort of reimagined, where the monkey is tempting Eve to take a bite of the forbidden fruit. Eve is posed as Venus in Botticelli's iconic painting, but with the crocodile, crocodile lying in her shell. So here, you know, another reference that will not be lost on many people would have been that it also is talking about the Kalila Wadimna, which is a translation of the Panchat, Panchatrata, which is an Indian fable collection written around the third century. So it's the story of the relationship, you know, between forms, between um, nature and human. And it's also how all of these things kind of come together, can be reoriented and can also be playful and witty. As you can see many of the characters here. So this theme sort of continues in this body of work with Hood's Red Rider, and here, here also European fairy tales, which carried deeply entrenched gender bias, which were part of many people's childhood storybooks. Here, I, I was in playing, pulling them out and creating, you know, um, again, like imagining the female protagonists in new fresh ways, another uh, series, th this, this particular series continues here. Then um, segments of desire go wandering off. Here you can see the uh, uprooted, multi-armed female who is trying to hold on to all that she desires, whether it's the, the chalava, which is blue in her arms, symbolizing impermanence, the turtle at the top, more like a, a kind of a doodle there, symbolizing endurance, a floating child, a portrait of a woman, whether it's the self-portrait of the artist. So all of these faces that have been partly obscured, they keep the racial cultural identity shifting. This is also a time when, you know, one is understanding or questioning the prevalence of these hyphenated identities. So this is time again, as I shared earlier, that there was those paintings that I worked with um, Donna Maria Bruton in, in the fact that we both painted in the same work. Here, this work also has uh, the artist David McGee's trickster in the center. So this, this sort of traces my later work in, in my interest in you know, stepping outside of the bounds of this page and doing much different types of interdisciplinary collaborations with other artists. But I just want to wrap up here and share some of the you know, kind of shifts that happen very deeply in, in, in the world, but also in the culture in America. So the many faces of Islam, another painting that I made long ago, but it never got reviewed till now, 20 years later, it was created though for the New York Times Magazine for a feature, Old Eyes and New Scenes from the Millennium, reimagined by living artists. But um, this, the work was done two years before 9-11. So, 
you know, it, it, though, though you wonder, oh, why? But the thing, the fact of the matter is that American foreign policy is familiar to a lot of people in the world that get affected by it. So there's already an understanding and an intimacy of America in different ways than a, a lot of times American, um, America itself or, the, or, or its citizens often will um, be aware of. And it, and it continues in the way American canon around culture and visual culture in general gets um, 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 canonized. So, so here, you know, I, I was referencing the 1990s as all about being war, coalitions, the alternating friends and foes, imposed sanctions, deaths, that were forgiven human rights that were brushed under the carpet as America flexed its military muscle around the world. So though I had been invited to imagine what would occupy a big, uh, which would be an occupying theme in the next millennium, I, I created a work imagining that it would be America's engagement with the Muslim countries around the world. So, you know, th this, I, 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 this has resonance in the fact that how I was affected, which was even works like the work that is on the right, um, was a is is a tiny part of a large mural commission that I had at that time with the law firm Scadden Arts, and nobody had any objections. I was painting on site, and nine, after nine eleven, you know this powerful iconography, which is about feminine resilience and potency, and it, it had nothing to do with violence. It was being called that it was violent and that there was a call to censor it and, and for me to be removed from the commission. So I, I walked out of the commission anyway, but these are things that interest me deeply again in terms of how trenchant historical symbols get activated, who gets to determine their meaning. Um, so this sort of theme at that time is echoed further in sly offering and no fly zone as just two examples of a larger body of work where I am interested in the notion of the empty throne. It's a motif that appears a lot at that time in my work and it references the threats to post-colonial autonomy in time of renewed imperialism. As post-colonial scholar Sadia Abbas has pointed out that the jets and angels clad in red, white, blue wings assert that the entire cosmic order is upheld or constrained by American power. So of course, you know, you see the oil derricks suggesting a planet dominated by American capitalism, but there's a lot of wit and there's a lot of play and a lot, a lot of time in the absence of that power, you see that women emerge. And women, women, women then bring in the complexity. So, so that that is something that you know I I played often with in terms of the broader representation of the feminine, not just a, a representation from the perspective of South Asia, but what it meant, the baggage that majority of feminine archetypes have had to carry. And um, so some so 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 these these works continue in that sort of register of um, of, uh, of, develop, of iconographies that are symbolic of multitude, where there's a metaphor for the many sides, often the narratives that are unseen, the sides of the unseen. So, um, you know, th this, this, this is also again happening in conversation with other um, engagements and dialogue and discussion and practices that are not just happening on the paper. So I began experimenting with scale and material in the early 90s, creating large scale painted murals, working with other artists. Here, Sharmila Desai would choreograph dances, and then she comes back into the painting on the right. And these sorts of magnification of scale through linking of, of um, murals and and works on these uh, uh, uh on paper as well as literally you know the, the translucent papers that were that were being built in conversation with the wall drawings i think led to an exploration of animation early on in 
in, in like 1999 and 2000 before there was even a high definition. So this, I, this, the notion of space, velocity, magnitude, direction, these are such essential elements that are inherent in the process of drawing. And they become active in, later on in my work through animation and music and linking time-based me mediums to the act of thinking. So all, all these directions are very much still connected to the act of the, of the hand. So everything is hand-drawn. It's very much about gesture and drawing. And then thinking of drawing as a libretto, if I'm thinking of working with a composer and making a film based out of drawings. So this sort of like ex exploration with image and scale and media started to shape my interest in political points of views as well. So, you know, uh, because you when you think of history, it is effectively an account of the movement of objects and bodies. Trade, slavery, migration, colonial occupation, these are all underlying currents, the root axis of modernity, how history is told, who gets to tell it, exposes the hierarchies of power in our world. And my, as my artistic process started incorporating research and reading and pushing my own limitations to learn different languages, you know, it was always in conversation with community and with listening and re-examining colonial and imperial stories of representation. So this sort of critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, remain uh, tenets on which I have built my entire understanding of, of, of an artist, of who, how I function as an artist, how culture, society, economy intersect, and how communities coalesce to play a role in how art functions in overlapping spaces and overlapping diasporas. So even this painting, Pleasure Pillars, at a time, at that time, was critiquing at then America's war in Afghanistan. And look at what's happened now, you know, again, 20 years later. At that time, it was being fought on often on the premise of saving Muslim women. And I was resisting that very paternalistic uh, uh, position and count, trying to counter that with, with, with the notion of the feminine as, as, uh, as courage and sensuality and, and, and the feminine as a, as a very poignant and present space and not something that, that needed to be saved. So, just wanted to share that you know some of these works were done such a long time ago, and they and what was fantastic about the about the survey, which was uh, which is traveling, is that it was connecting with a younger generation. And for for any artist, that's really exciting. Is is when the work, you know, can can speak to the younger, so it can be part of the future, and 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 that that has another very beautiful resonance in the fact that how I look back at history to move, to create new, new interpretations, but I'm also looking at my own work in terms of mining ideas that may have existed 20, 30 years ago. Um, so, so, you know, so the, these kind of conversations have happened outside in different diasporas, working with uh, working in, with artists like at the row houses in the third ward when I was in Texas, Houston. So this sort of shift doesn't just happen by, um, uh, you know, it always happens in dialogue. And I just kind of wanted to reiterate that whether it's storytelling, spoken word, literature, poetry, jazz, often these shared territories of engagement and curiosity and struggle offer new political spaces. So here too, the trenchant historical symbols, which are about the orientalist representations of the Muslim female and the anti-blackness in art historical traditions were the ones that I was like questioning and they percolate in this particular work in the series. So which brings me to another uh, recent work, which has had a history in the 90s is Epistrophe that I created at the Morgan Library. So in the 1990s, and 2000s when I, I, I was working in this way, these installations of layered tracing paper drawings, 
often in combination, you know, with the wall drawings as a counterpoint. But when this show came about, I was like, how to show a glimpse of that time. So I offered to make the work on site. And, and these are some of the images of how the work was being created um, in conversation with some of the paintings that I too was viewing after all these years for the first time since I had made them. So, uh, so, so just to sort of show, you know, um, these, these types of works had um, scaled up often in, into entire room size installations. And what I really um, enjoyed making when I was making th this type of work that there was, everything was transparent always, it was visible. There was movement, the physicality of paper was always evident. So all marks, including flaws, became part of the piece. It had no borders. It could expand in any direction. And it became a site which was multivalent. Even if it was unstable, it was multivalent. And that was really the, the kind of ethos of, of this type of direction. And, and though this, the, this kind of work would require a different type of labor, skill, and pace than the smaller works with their very intricate compositions. But for me, uh, it has always been in, in a similar ritual in dialogue. It, it just goes, it's a very fluid engagement between these uh, multiple discourses. And, um, and you know, and when, when, you, when you think that how, um, uh, how we come, how animation itself, like these are, these are stills from animation that I, I, when I think of animation, I'm thinking first of myself as a thinker and like drawing becomes my thinking tool. And while I, I would be looking at maybe historical paintings, I would always imagine them as full of movement and just buzzing at the edges that there was always a hint of a greater world and a different heroic representation. So their scale wouldn't be limiting their potential. Their scale was almost in depth. In, I was indifferent to the scale. They always had an epic storytelling within a very tiny scale. And that has always been a, another thing to um, unravel or be inspired by like how to pack information in the smallest possible space and yet and 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 be able to um, almost let it explode outside so some of these are um, are this is these are works that are both you are seeing details in in the drawn form as well as stills from the animation and then you can also see how they have allowed another way of of uh, engaging with the work as, as uh, projections and um, collaborative spaces where the composer has often performed live. So, you know, so when I, when I think of this, it's like um, they, these works allude to the interstices, the transitory, the mythos of the migrant, the citizen, the positions and the dichotomies of power, women, power, artists, kind of everything that's caught between, between in the in-between space, between worlds or between artistic vocabularies or between cultures or the practices or between histories and that sort of back and forth. And um, here is uh, just an example of the drawn on the left. And this is a sort of a portrait of Adam Smith, the economist, philosopher, author of Wealth of Nations who argues against the monopolies of using sort of the demise of the East India Company as a case study. So this work that's on the right is my uh, a public artwork at Princeton University, where um, he's sort of dressed in the attire of the East India Company, but still sort of his lofty ideas are still sort of trapped um, in that glass space. It's a 30 foot painting kind of suggesting that, you know, he, you, he, the lofty ideas were meant to open up the premise or open up that um, argument, but, but we, we are still sort of caught in the same old patterns of inequities of wealth. So it was kind of my play that he's, um, you know, in the, he's unable to fly 
even though he's in there in the economics building and he is in this luminous glass, but he's trapped. So the, these are just sharing with students how, I, how these iconographies are always emerging in conversation with, with the context of the project at hand as well. So even moving into the territory of glass was because um, for the longevity of, of the work, you know, for a public art project, it had to be outside of works on paper. But the process of making the glass works was very much based similarly in terms of how I paint and draw with ink. Um, so these are some of the sketches that led to that um, the work that you just saw, which is uh, which is quite large than the than the works. The works on paper are like 16, 17 inches, and these are like 30, 25, 30 feet. So um, so this kind of engagement with with drawing is obviously I keep coming back at it. So it's a very cyclical process of movement for me too, as, a, as an artist, how I work. Another large, as the work started to, to increase in size, these are very detailed drawings that are sometimes eight feet, nine feet. And even in the making of these paint, of, of such a painting, I would, uh, I would um, you know, record different stages and that have led to the, um, to the build, uh, to the building of more detailed, elaborate films like Parallax. So and the, the work Parallax um, is, it was done for the Charger Art Biennial, so it deals with that region. But when I went there to do research, I wanted to focus on the Strait of Hormuz, and I wanted to look at maritime trade, the movement of resources and commodities, naval warfare, Again, the history of East India Company, the imperial air, the land, uh, travel routes, all sorts of interdisciplinary visual verbal languages. So I, I worked with uh, poets and worked with Diyan, um, uh, the composer, and we kind of worked with different languages also um, to create this work. But just coming back in terms of how it's made, these drawings are small sometimes just um, 12 inches. But when I scan them at super high resolution, they can allow the work to exist at 30 meters or you know, 70, 80 feet. And um, that process almost made me imagine the work as this kind of, as if satellite imagery was happening. And it just kind of expands the notion of scale in a very different manner. And, um, so the limitations that may may have that I may have encountered within the engagement with the manuscript, they sort of fall apart as I keep exploring and experimenting with um, uh, with different ways of interpreting the the sets of problems I often encounter and how I go about solving them. So um, again, uh, the uh, the. The score has been performed live with sopranos, with different artists, with poets. And uh, it, it, this piece continued to travel for many years around the world. There's another work that I wanna quickly uh, uh, share with you guys is another work which, which was part of the show here at the um, Morgan Library. And I had done a sculpture last year and everybody was like, oh, how come you're making a sculpture now? So I kind of want to show the, uh, the intimacy between the painting and the sculpture. So I made this painting 20 years ago and the sketch was already there. And then when I was on the committee uh, in 2017, the New York City Mural Advisory Commission on City Arts, Monuments and Markers. And I, during that process, hearing all the public opinions about public monuments, the complicated histories, the reckoning, tensions between, you know, different representations and different um, communities, and uh, as well as a very overt male representation of historical monuments, I kept thinking that my work was already very much about an anti-monument, that it was always an anti-monument, that it had always engaged the past, but never glorified it. So I was like, all I need to do is make the, my painting into a sculpture and it might 
and then see what happens, even for myself, as well as to sort of re reorient a different way of engaging with my practice. So that's how the sculpture came about. And as I was making it, you know, I, I, I was reminded that this painting was also the very first time that I um, made an animation. So I was making this painting and scanning its different stages. And I made like an animation at, uh, at a residency in Art Pace, I think in 2000. So it's so that, so like how generative, you know, um, the work can be in its desire to engage um, uh, with, with, with a kind of an interdisciplinary ethos. And so, so the sculpture, when making the sculpture, of course, had, it, had, had its own set of issues and problems. I had to understand uh, the, the entire kind of dimension, whether this posture was even possible. So, so that was very exciting that this light, that this little sketch kind of came about at that time when I worked on a banner exhibition with uh, Farish de Daftari. And at that time it was engaging art histories, classicism and ethnocentric reactions to Indian art, um, uh, you know, kind of, kind of in reading Winkleman's doctrine, but I was thinking mannerism and, and the Indian aesthetic. But then when I started making the sculpture, it was also about the classical statuary as being often not just um, often being colored and not just how we imagine it to be um, um, devoid of color. So this this kind of entanglement is you know you can see that the references are so many and and looking at uh, the incredible tradition of of South Asian's cultural history of bronze as well as interest in, in, in other kind of genres, how they sort of come together to create this piece that um, is best described by Gayatri Gopinath when she sort of reads a queer reading in, in the work. And um, it talks about um, that their suggestive embrace, the intertwined female bodies, they bear the symbolic weight of communal identities from across multiple temporal and geographic terrains. So, so sort of whether the promiscuous intimacies are of multiple times, spaces, art historical traditions, bodies, desires, you know, they, they can be, they, that we can read the history in different ways as well. And, um, and, and, that, and that's, that sort of opens up another multiple ways of engaging as an artist with think with ideas that I had touched upon versus again in conversation with a, a, a kind of a public consciousness of that moment. And at that time in 2017 and 18, the, the, the notion of the monuments was so much on my mind. So that was that was another way I thought it was a witty way of making the painting into a sculpture. Um, I, I just want to be aware of the time here. And um, so just let me know if, uh, if you need me to end it, I can end it at this point. And I will just sort of mention here that, you know, um, doing animated large multi-channel films have also been about engaging say the pixel and then thinking of the pixel in conversation with the unit of the mosaic. So coming to mosaic has not been, oh, let's do a mosaic now. <laughs> it was more like thinking of the pixel in so many ways and then realizing that, oh, well, it, it, it allows me to again engage with, a, of course, a historically um, um, old technical technique that, 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 that kind of calls out art, art history in, in multiple ways through, through, through this sort of space of the an animation. And even this piece that is at the Princeton University, the way the 77 piece uh, foot piece that was made was, um, I, I took a still from an animation of mine. So, you know, I start with drawing and then it's animated. Then that kind of movement that's caught in that still was, uh, 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 was the basis to create the work and, and a very hands-on 
engagement with it. So just kind of sharing how, you know, so you can get a sense of scale that it's not all just about happening on a very small scale. It's happening in multiple scales in multiple ways, but there is this sort of desire for it to be um, the, the kind of the, int the intimacy is always very present in, 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 the, in, the, in the work that I create. So I'm gonna stop here so that we have a chance to talk, but I'm gonna keep um, the PowerPoint on, on in case there are any um, questions that will benefit my sharing some more images. So over to you, Sam. Thank you, Shazia. That was just brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, so um, please do um, enter some questions in. I see that we have some already, but uh, if, you, if you have any questions, as, um, we'll uh, try to get to them all, seeing how, seeing how it goes. Um, I don't know if I should go back to the beginning, but I'll, uh, Maybe I'll start with this one. Um, <clears throat> um, this question's from Hillary. She says, um, your use of Hindu iconography reminds me of the Muslim Indian artist, M.F. Hussain, who was rejected to criticism from Hindu fundamentalists for painting Hindu goddesses in his artwork. Has such appropriation issues ever concerned your choice of what can or should be represented? I am engaging with the Indus Valley civilization. I think a lot of it I was aware of growing up in Pakistan. It's all in Punjab. It's in the Harappa Mohenjo-Daro. So a lot of visits over there with the Buddhist sites in, um, in North Pakistan. So, you know, it's a very syncretic history. It's not, I don't see it um, benefiting by these um, artificial boundaries of, of religion. Like when I look at look at it, I'm looking at the syncretic history, which is in the which is very prevalent in the visual language. Mm -hmm. And I also think, like you know, his, his issue would be uh, a much more issue of how um, being a Muslim in India is. It's as you see currently, it's a very difficult and politicized space, and of course, a different generation. So. Um, I, I've never had that concern for myself, or even in terms of how I, I see how, how I'm engaging with the work. It's not looking at Hindu goddesses. But oftentimes that's like, that's the problem. I think people will be like, oh, your work's all about Hindu goddesses, but actually it isn't. And I think that's what really beautifully what gets done is at the Morgan exhibition and the traveling exhibition is that the didactics are almost radical. They talk about the work and there's no weird subtext about, you know, artists of color or some, somebody from another kind of culture. And, and it just talks about the work and, and, and it unpacks the work and you, you learn and you understand all the different kind of range and variety of things that are unfolding. So, so you know, I, I, I would encourage that maybe you should also kind of pick the book if you didn't get a chance to see the show. And that might help understand in terms of like all these sort of political flame, frame, frameworks, especially around the, around the notion of, of nation and the different nationalisms that, that, that have been very prevalent post 9-11. Um, <clears throat> this question comes from Yael. Uh, she's wondering, is there a narrative slash emotional connection between the Genji tale from the 12th century and your work? Sorry, a con sorry, I didn't understand the conflict. A, a narrative or emotional and or an emotional connection between the Genji, um, G-E-N-J-I tale from the 12th century and your work? Um, I, 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 you know, for, first of all, when I'm engaging, with, with the past and I'm kind of thinking myself more like a art historian or a, or a detective. I, it's, not, it's not romanticizing it. It's not like, there's no nostalgia. 
it's really a very kind of like a desire to um, reread it, like the way you may reread different literary texts. And um, so when I think of my work, I often think that if, depending on projects or different conversations that have organically emerged, that you know, when one is focusing on a specific uh, work or a specific body of work, which might be tied, might have a complicated provenance, or I, I'm going to analyze it, and and that that kind of re removes the nostalgia or the emotional connection is of course there as an artist. Like I want the viewer to have an emotional connection with my work. And as a painter, as an artist, I, I, mine is a very intuitive kind of process of putting, you know, putting all the things that have fed my head and, and kind of creating a link with the brain and the art and the hand and the gesture and, and, and hoping and imagining that that kind of um, gets into the work. So it's more, it's more in the process of making that I want the experience when the work is is there that the viewer has has an emotional experience to it. Um, a couple of questions that are kind of related um, to that and to each other. Um, this is from Paula, she asks if you've ever. She says you've you've had your hand in absolutely every medium. Do you have a favorite in, in which to express yourself? And, um, and then another uh, question is from Michelle and they say um, sort of a follow-up to that, are, are some of the, your works more personal to, than others? So first of all, I wanna say, like I, I rarely hear you know, anybody saying, oh, what, William Kentridge, why are you making so many different, why are you like, it's, experimenting in so many different languages. So I kind of want to just point that out. <laughs> I also think that all my work is not that, it's not like going and experimenting with so many different um, mediums and materials. It's all tied to a thinking process. I, I it, like any artist, it's a thinking process. And then I think the immediacy of drawing is what really allows me to shape an idea and then as, as that idea is you know, happening and how you cull it out, you're gonna read, you're gonna talk with others, you're gonna figure out what's the best um, vehicle in which to shape that idea. And, and that's, that's whatever that may be. And then you understand that. So that's how I see the practice overall. Um, I wonder maybe, uh, well, Here's a question from Natasha. Um, they say, uh, she says, first, thank you so much for your presence today. This has been deeply interesting and your work means a lot to me. I want to ask, can you speak more about your research process, which I think you were just sort of talking about a little bit, but do you have an idea about researching or do you generally research and make worse the work based on it? Um, you know- Bef Idea before researching, I'm sorry. It can be, I think you're like, it happens both ways. I have had opportunity to, to pursue an idea that I had like maybe 20 years ago. And, and, I, and, and then it was just, I forgot about it. And then the right situation came about and it, it had to happen. It can very well be you get invited for a project and you have to, um, respond and put a proposal together. And at that time, you're going to do the research. And, and it can really be um, driven by uh, a very, in, as a, you know, as a curious individual, like uh, sometimes literally walking in New York City and, and, and encountering spaces and then be like, oh, you know, what's the history of this particular space? And, and I have done research just because of that, that digging a little bit deeper and then realizing, you know, uh, that, that that place and that site has, has so much um, history that defies location and geography and it kind of steps 
removes it from from your immediate understanding that it's about New York and it isn't and it it becomes about something else. So it it, it it's very enmeshed. It's not one one thing or the other. I hope that answered. Um, but I, I was always I, I just wanted to add that I am very inspired by poetry. So oftentimes I do read poetry and there are a couple of poets that I have continued to read. And some of course are Audre Lorde, Adrian Rich, but I just wanna share some um, um, younger poets like Solmaz Sharif also. So like a young poets um, that, that are also playing with language and politics and just kind of spinning it around and making you think completely, you know, where you think outside of the, outside of all your assumptions. So I, I find like when I look at the paintings that I make, oftentimes I think I can, the best way that I can for, for myself to equate them is like each is a singular point. Um, so this question comes from Michelle and um, forgive me if I mispronounce these names, but she says, it's fascinating to how, it's fascinating how you connect literary criti criticism with your process. Um, can you speak more about how Kristeva and Sisu, um, C-I-X-O-U-S, yeah. have influenced your work? Yeah, so, you know, that, that was such a long time ago. <laughs> So when I was thinking in terms of, um, you know, how, what, what can be like a uniquely feminine language or what, what is, what are some of the other ways of thinking about like the female, like the development of a female vocabulary, the utterances. So like, I remember at that time, Helen Sassoos in particular, her, um, this idea of the feminine utterances, this, that's, and then also like the idea of white, there is a, there was a term in there about the white line or the white, the, the notion of the, of the, of, of the space that's devoid of color. And that was something that, you know, just I gravitated to because I, I was already thinking in terms of the baggage of the material that I had that though I, I had a particular kind of engagement with a language, um, the material itself was not, you know, it was very normal. It was very contemporary. It was water-based, watercolor, uh, um, gouache, just kind of created a little bit differently. So there was always this kind of a large amount of white that you would kind of create and at different types of combinations of white for porosity and transparency and opacity. And here there was always this kind of um, desire to fetishize that when no matter what I was doing, it was always like, oh, it's like such exotic techniques or your ancient techniques or you're painting with a single head brush or like, what are these ancient techniques, you know, that, that you're kind of contemporizing. And I'm like, it's in the application, it's in the attitude if I, the types of work that I, I was making or can make, they, they just, you have to work a certain way where there's the ritual of like working 14 hours or 18 hours a day. It's like controlling your hand and your mind in a certain meditative manner that you, you become very steady and in sync with that type of like int intimate, intricate nano kind of particle detail. And so it was never about, so that's why I was like, okay, how do you break some of these very prevalent um, gendered reads in terms, of, um, in terms of women and languages and, and languages that, that have a very masculine um, space in the history has often been told from a very masculine space and, and what, what some of the French linguists and theorists and the French women that I kind of came across, I was like, okay, they were resisting that and what exactly were they doing? And this was in conversation because I had, I was reading um, a lot of Pakistani young um, poets 
and writers and nobody kind of knew about them. So, you know, again, like nobody's asking me about, about Praveen Chakir or Fahmida Riaz or Smit Chiktai, but I always keep getting asked about um, Helen Sisu or somebody else. So, so again, at that time, it was like, I was already bringing these, all of these things in conversation and whatever at that time, I don't know, don't, don't know if intersectionality was even a term then, but that that's where where the some of these references come is in the kind of engagement and rereading of a lot of of um, feminine um, constructs and philosophers from multiple uh, spaces across the world from different trajectories and histories and how they kind of collapse and what are some of the common grounds that speak to me and how I can be witty or creative about them and run with with something that has a link and I'm going to take that and then find a way to make uh, use it in, in terms of what I was creating which was always far more intuitive and driven by material and and ha and my kind of you know manipulation of material how I could transform the material so that's that's kind of how I can loosely share in terms of you know how some of some of these things eventually feed feed me. They feed in a very kind of yeah, kind of like a nebulous manner, but they're there. So interesting. Um, I, are we doing okay? I've got a few more questions if you can. I'm fine. I, okay. <laughs> I, I, I took too much time, so. No, no, um, not at all. I think we could, I think we can go for a while, but, um, okay. Um, so, uh, this question is, um, well, it's related to what you, you were just speaking about, I think. So, um, Erica's wondering when you started learning manuscript painting, what originally drew you to, to it? And do you have ideas? Did you have ideas of the direction you wanted to take it when you started? Absolutely. I, I, I did not, I came to art in Pakistan at a time when I was, um, you know, kind of the culture was changing, shifting, and that too <laughs> was because there was a war unfolding in the backyard. So like that region and the war in Afghanistan, this US Soviet Pak kind of this whole sort of shift that's happening um, at that time. And then there's the fall of Berlin Wall and, you know, things, the world was changing, shifting dramatically. And, 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 and in particular in Pakistan, sort of, you know, under the time in the eighties, the military, uh, Zia's period, Jalhak's period, like there's a, there was definitely kind of a different sort of culture coming in place where mobility for women, just was getting kind of a little bit difficult. I, I, that's my experience of like where you, how you could move around physically in the city also. And, and, and um, you know, so like, uh, uh, so when, when, when that, when you think of, um, um, yeah, like the shifts that happen culturally, and, and then when you're like, okay, how, who do you gravitate to? I was gravitate, I wanted to gravitate to humanities because that's where I could be think, I could be with like-minded people or I could be with people that would inspire me to, that, that would inspire me to think outside of the box that could, that would help shape my thinking. So I was studying mathematics and, uh, and then I, I kind of left that and kind of, went digging into the direction of the art school. And that's how, when I came to miniature, kind of I saw miniature painting, it was not a very popular uh, subject being at that time in 1987, but I thought like that dynamic of, of uh, what the high and low art or what is considered, you know, avant-garde and what, what is laden and burdened with something else and how do we define what is tradition who gets to define what is tradition and how tradition is performed and all of that 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 sort of started to occupy uh, uh, me and and the only way for me to really 
get a very hands-on experience was to um, be take take that class and then eventually start working full time, like eighteen hours a day with with the master painter. So I knew that I that I had to learn whatever he was going to share, and then I would have the time later to um, to kind of you know develop develop it in, in 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 as many directions as I wanted and and within so even while I was a student with him um uh, I I kind of immediately created a, a rupture that had not yet happened by creating a five foot um miniature painting rather than things that were based very much on typical sort of thematic spaces like contemporizing a festival or contemporizing a wedding or contemporizing themes that had been sort of historically present in the residual notion of like this kind of uh, revival of this craft based work so 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 it was it was it was the yearning of any young artist right obviously you 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 want to learn and then you want to speak so it wasn't that different than you know what what you guys or artists here would be doing. Um, this was actually the uh, the first question I was asked or in the chat. So it just but it really pertains to this moment. Um, Paula Hornbustel is at, is wondering if the poltergeist in your awesome scroll from 1989 to 90 is autobiographical. Um, and she says, I like how the length of the scroll made in such an important year as 1989 is suggestive of a wall taking it all down with her, quote, freedom to go anywhere, everywhere. That's, uh, that's very beautiful. Thank you for that observation. But, but I think that, that at that time, yes, I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to spend most of my time painting this work and I'm and the culture around me is also a little bit like closing in, then might as well <laughs> look at, you know, look at like uh, use of space within different, how, how interiority of a space has been analyzed by other artists in traditions, in contemporary architecture in the region and in the Safavid paintings and, you know, those uh, photo montages of Hockney at that time or, all, all sorts of different ways of understanding even like the unraveling of space in um, Hitchcock's films or Satyajit Ray's films. So, so it, was, it, was, it was tapping into that particular moment also in the fall of Berlin Wall and you know, how, how, how like in some places the cultures are opening and in Pakistan, you know, no, there was a kind of a emphasis on shifting the culture and how it's not just happening from within the country. It was all obviously happening because of the large sort of mili militarization, the whole sort of military systems that exist in our world and the mechanisms for war. So, so it's um, it's when I now look at it, it, it it's it's not just a story of of it's not like an autobiography of me in my home. It's it was never that. It was so much more. Okay, uh, this is a very direct question. What's, uh, Irene is wondering what size is segments of desire go wandering off? Um, I, I'm, I don't, uh, it's uh, probably 20 inches wide. So it's not that, it's not like 10 inches and seven inches tall. So it's not like a tiny miniature, but you know, it's just, it's fairly small. And then um, maybe this will be our last question um, from Anonymous. They say, Shazia, uh, you spoke about female agency, which is a recurring theme in your work. Can you expand a little on how you interpret or understand female ag agency in your works, its relationship to sexuality, eroticism, and other aspects? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so how, <laughs> of course, so I think, um, as you saw in the sculpture, you know, when, when even, even though the, 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 the 
feminine forms are playful. It's like you cannot tell who is in a position of power. And you come and you see it. And as you're seeing it from different sides, it keeps switching and changing. So, so that kind of playfulness is, I think, something that's, um, uh, that inspires me. It's like, okay, how can I keep multiple interpretations um, alive and happening? So even though that uh, I may be, you know, interested in kind of bridging or critiquing the silos in art history, I still kind of want to understand that, you know, the the burden, the feminine, the burden that a feminine archetype from another space, another time, another kind of non, um, um, from different different uh, di different regions and different histories. There's a similar. There is a space that gets shared too. So how, if I if I'm interested in telling kind of richer stories around that, I have to play with a, a kind of a level of buoyancy. Where, where the feminine is um, kind of afloat or that notion of flight is, you know, a light or light or she kind of rises to the surface or um, she is, she knows how to carry the burden or the weight and the burden or the weight does not like you know, bury her in the annals of time. So when I think of it like that way, then, you know, with that, it can, it can allow me to think of, of, um, of, of how, how, how to keep that kind of trenchant historical symbol, just full of a multivalence, full of multiple ways, whether it's uh, going from sexuality to sensuality to oftentimes an androgynous space, but, but it's with the intent that it can kind of keep circling into multiple spaces. So that, that's how, that's the best I can explain in terms of like the um, expansion of the feminine. All right, well, um, I don't think we have any more questions. So I thank you on behalf of the studio school for this really generous talk. Um, it's amazing to be able to get close to your work here on the computer. So um, <laughs> congratulations on the exhibition. And, you know, I just, I hope we have the chance to see each other in, in person soon, um, perhaps at the school or, or somewhere else. Um, but last thoughts for you, Shazia, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, that was, that was amazing. Thank you all of you for your engagement and, and for all these questions. So appreciate it. And good luck to all the students there. And I and, and hope to next time to meet in person with everybody. Indeed. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks.